Hello everyone, it is Tech Sags Rewind presented by T-Mobile and T-Mobile wants to remind you to visit T-Mobile.com slash across America to learn how you can get value and coverage with T-Mobile. We've got Mary Bear with us, we got Anna Rosa Peterson with us, and I've got to address the elephant in the room. <laughs> so what was the response from Olin when he saw the new look? Because I, I was told he responded like Olin would typically respond. He actually responded better than I expected. But he said it matched my hoodie, which is just wrong. Is that not the same color? He's pink in my Oh, there you go. I'm assuming it is. <laughs> Probably. Well, but yeah. We like it. It looks good. Thank you. Um, not so much Nick. No, he, he doesn't look too good, but it's all right. So, uh, Anna Rosa Peterson, do you remember what we had on the show today? Who we had? We had Kendall Rogers. He was really good. We had Andrew Monaco. Yep. Not in that exact order. We had Billy Lucci. Classic. Right. Ryan Ronnie. He was good. We had a lot. Who am I missing? Basically, I don't have the thing in front of me to tell me who was that we're spotlighting, but just watch this show. You're going to love it. And uh pa- No, nah, sorry. I lost interest. You left me hanging. Yeah, my Oh. Never mind. It is Texax Rewind. Yeah, yeah. It's Texax Rewind brought to you by T-Mobile. We have to give some some time here to the women's basketball team. Gary Blair retires a couple weeks back. And uh, it's going to be hard to follow what he did here at A&M. Now, I have to tell you, I don't know much about Joni Taylor other than what I could find on Wikipedia and knowing Georgia's reputation in the NCAA tournament and obviously the A&M press release. But from a quick scan this morning, I got a heads up that this news was coming. I started, started doing my research. Looks like they got themselves a really good coach. Well, I would think, um, I would expect that, Yeah, you know, um, she, uh, I, I know Georgia is not known for basketball. And I know that they have a, or if they still have it, they have a horrific place to play. You know, you're not going to win over anybody with their facilities. Right. Uh, if, they're, they're, if they're still what they were when I, when I went there. And I think they are. Um, that said, um, she still had, you know, pretty good success. I think they were like 21 and nine or 21 yeah. and 10 this year. Um, so you wonder, Hey, what can this woman do, uh, with a program that has a history of, uh, of being successful with better facilities and, you know, more emphasis behind it. Now, I'm not saying that Georgia's never had emphasis. They, they had Andy Landers as the coach there and he was really successful for a long time. But since then, um, you know, she, she's done some good things. So, it might not be that higher that everybody would, would know the... No, everybody was concentrating on the man down the road in Austin, right. which wasn't going to happen. So you do wonder about... I wonder what, if, if I was talking to someone who's really nationally in, plugged, know, in. plugged in to women's basketball, like I used to be back in the right. day, um, what their thoughts would be. But uh, I, I, I believe Russ, Ross Bjork... Uh, puts in a lot of effort and sure and he's probably talked to you know dozens of people to uh you know come to this you know to this decision to hire her well how about this i know a guy okay. who researches women's basketball okay like he knows who like and he had a a top three list and apparently Joni Taylor was number one on that list. Let's, let's go to our magical phone line and talk to behind the glass director Dalton Hughes, who <laughs> was bragging that he really wanted Joni Taylor. I mean, I wouldn't say bragging. There was a couple of names uh, when you, know, you found out that Blair was leaving. Obviously, the first name wasn't going to happen. We've talked about that. This was the next name that I came to, and it stems back to I've done a lot of interviews with Blair with both you, David, and Gabe. And I remember, if, if I was good at my job, I would have gone and found this, but Blair gushed over Joni Taylor as a head coach, what she was doing at Georgia. And then I've watched her play. I've watched her coach against A&M. It's clear that she can recruit really well. Uh, so, yeah, I'm excited. I, th- I think she's going to do a great job here. Well, that's, that's uh, She is the one that replaced Landers, and that's correct. a hard thing to do. Yeah. She's also replacing two best friends now in her two past And jobs. they haven't had the same success, but, again, that's hard to do at Georgia, but she has had, she has been successful. Yeah. You know, it's like saying, um, Andy Landers is the most successful coach, uh, women's coach ever at Georgia, right? As far as I know, he may have been the only one, but I don't, but it's like, 
is the next, and I don't want to go to the, is the next coach at Baylor can be successful, but are they going to be as successful as Kim? As Kim. Yeah. Well, I don't know if she'll be as successful as Gary, but this is a woman, she might be even more successful. This is a woman that has had to follow the best ever and without great facilities and all those things and, uh, and has had success. Now, I did not know that Dalton was an expert on women's basketball. I didn't either until you chatted But if he me. says that it, she's it comes the one. With sitting in this chair. Ronnie, <laughs> Ronnie covered women's basketball. He was here. The first beat that I covered when I was at Texas was women's basketball. So, you know, kind of got into it and stuck. We got to have someone that at least pays attention to it. But, yeah, I didn't call my shot. I didn't say this was going to be it. But That's who you wanted, I said though. If I said people that, hey, I would call. <laughs> She was the first name if, I said. If I Dalton call. is good with it, then that's all I need to know. Well, if Dalton's I'm glad good Olin's with it. got my back. Billy, I saw you find the good fight on Twitter yesterday, as you always do when it comes to A and M. Just your overall thoughts and what you saw um, with the vibe yesterday at Pro Day. Yeah, I thought you know people people and I just got off SEC radio with Burns and Doring, and, and Burns started off like, should that should we be concerned with that? And I said, no, I think the only, yeah, I think. Unfortunately, Jalen should be concerned. Why am I? I wish I, I really was hoping to see him run a faster time for his sake. Uh, look, I I, ne- I knew that Jalen wasn't the speed was never the strength of his game. Um, he was like a big guy that when he got the ball in stride could rumble, you know, and you were going to have a hard time bringing him down. But I don't think anyone that's watched him play, and, and if they did, then you weren't. You just, I guess you were just choosing to ignore something. Like, he was not going to be a guy that ran a fast 40 at Pro Day. I would have hoped he would have run faster than he did. That's the only thing. Like, if you'd have told me over under at 485, 49 even, I would have said, oh man, that's a tough one. You know, I would have thought he was maybe being the four, high 48, and that would have been with a lot of, you know, training. But, to come in at you know, in the mid four, you know, five O's, that's that's a problem for him. It's something that he's going to now have to overcome, and I, I don't know if he'll be able to overcome it between now and draft day in terms of his his stock taking a big hit. But uh, those other guys, like you know, Isaiah, ran a fine time for what the way Isaiah plays the game. I don't think I think that's about what everyone would have expected he would have run. Uh, I talked to some. You know, like Michael Clemens on that side of things, he ran a four eight. Um, I think that's about you watch his tape. That's about what you'd expect. He, you know, I think he was hopeful he could have run a little bit faster. But Michael Clemens helped himself as much as anybody yesterday. I think he and Hansford really helped themselves. Uh, and I, I walked away for kind of the, you know, the opposite of what you were hearing about Weidemeyer's. I walked away. People said Clemens could go. You know, Zerline said second, third. I talked to two other scouts I've known for a long time that said fourth seems to be the floor for him. Third is the most likely landing spot. Start things off with Marquise Collins. I know you had a report on him recently. Yeah, he's supposed to come to practice today, so not a super far drive, just across yeah. town. Remains in contact with A&M and Tommy Robinson. Just took a trip to Utah last weekend. Utah's a school that's really recruiting him hard, and I'll say this about what I like about that is Utah has a history of coming into the state and offering guys that everybody that kind of does what I do, they really like their offers when they come in state and they offer kids. Um, there was a they got a tight end that was there named Brant Keithy who was at Cinco Ranch who I saw it was way it was back when Coach Sumlin was coaching, but Utah offered him and took him and he turned him into a monster. They, there's a couple of kids in the from the Dallas area that have gone to Utah and been super successful. So Utah is a school when they offer and they bring a kid in. I do kind of take note of that. Is kind of like a merit for for the kid, uh, Marquise. We'll see. Like um, A&M's also got Cedric Baxter out of Orlando mm-hmm. coming in this weekend. Edgewood High School there. That's a kid that just talking to folks, uh, our sources around the country that, and, and some in Florida have even said like that relationship goes way back with Jimbo. Like grew up like in Florida State, so Jimbo's going to have a really good chance at that one uh, as things progress. He's coming in this weekend so big big time visit for a&m he's one of the best backs in the country looks a lot like derrick henry on tape 
here we are with the Aggies winning last night and scoring some runs and uh, obviously the series against LSU. Yeah, I mean, I tell you what, I was not expecting what I saw in Baton Rouge. I think obviously uh, LSU's atrocious defense had a little something to do with that. But I'll say this, um, when I look at you know A&M's offense, um, I thought their approach against LSU was very good. The, because LSU made some really, really tough and close pitches on the outside corner. It just seemed to me like every time they did that and any time that ball was barely off the plate, uh, A&M did not swing at it. So I give them a lot of credit, and I give Mike Early a lot of credit for having that offensive position to uh, take a big step forward. You know, I, I felt like um, that weekend series was a big step forward for that offensive term to just kind of, I, I don't know, establish kind of a different approach and a different look the rest of the season. Because if you look at last night, it was very much the same, right? I mean, it was kind of the same approach. They, they made guys work. They were working counts and things like that. They were hunting fastballs. And so uh, I was really impressed with them over the weekend. I thought they played defense. I think when you look at, you know, uh, you know, Boast and the job he did at second for a guy who's never played that position to go play that, um, that was really impressive. That's really hard to do at any level, much less major Division One baseball. So uh, all is well so far. I mean, they played very well over the weekend, and it showed in the, in the series. And frankly, uh, if you're Schloss, like you got to be disappointed that you didn't sweep because you you know you left 14 runners on was it 14 or 15 runners on base, and not only should you have won that last game, but you should have blown them out. So uh, you know they'll look back at, at that game and go, hey, we should have, we should have swept it. But you know, asking for a sweep in Baton Rouge is, is, is you know asking for a lot to say the least. Well, and how about this? I mean, you talked offense uh, and you know holding out on, on counts for a long time, but. Five home runs against LSU in that series. Two last night. Seven in these last four games. Just, uh, and they're doing it without Trevor Warner. By the way, they're hitting some dingers. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, I think you, you know, some of the guys that we coming into the season would be we expected to have big years are starting to hit the ball well. You know, Logan Britt showed some power. Brett Minnick showed some power. Both of those guys, I feel like, are guys that you know when when you look at the way you want a prospect to look, that's the way you want them to look. Um, they're finally. At least, uh, you know, in some games, they're they're kind of tapping into that potential. Your Ryan Targoch, uh, I think when you look at the job that he did over the weekend at Baton Rouge, certainly that that big mammoth home run he had uh, early in that series kind of set the tone for the weekend. I thought, and um, you know, he, he's had some big hits, and so I think they're get they're getting production from a lot of guys uh, up and down that lineup. And the thing that's kind of interesting about this team, all of a sudden. And I'm not sitting there saying, like, one weekend has me sold because I, I kind of want to see them emulate that performance this weekend. You know, if they lose some three at home to Auburn, uh, then all of a sudden you're thinking, um, you know, you're thinking, oh, that was, that was an aberration. But if they if they play like they did last weekend, this weekend, I'll be sold. They're kind of turning the corner. And if you're looking ahead, you know, Trevor Warner is likely coming back in two or three weeks, potentially. So if they get him back in two or three weeks and this offense is, is, is hitting like they did this past weekend, you could be talking about a team that has a little bit different trajectory at the end of the year than right than they did maybe two weeks ago. Well, uh, <laughs> what are we supposed to do? Like, like, subscribe, comment, share, tell everyone to watch it. You watch it twelve times. Has anybody actually ever liked it after they watched it? Just answer yeah. below. <laughs> you, you look here; it doesn't count. <laughs> Subscribed afterwards. Oh, no, no, I'm subscribed. I'm all in. Or you know, shared it with a friend. Have any of you done that? If you have. I just want to. If you haven't, you should. Yeah. I think this is going to end this uh, version of the show, so bye bye.